out on this beautiful night to uh, yeah, be warmed by God's Word and as His Spirit uh, speaks to us through His holy inspired Word. So a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. A uh, couple of quick announcements. I hope each person has a handout that uh, Emmanuel is giving out and a pen. And also please that you, each person would need a Bible because uh, we'll be reading God's Word regularly tonight. So uh, encourage you to have them handy. I also want to thank my dear wife Jenny uh, for cooking us a beautiful soup and rolls. Thank you, darling. And thank you for making it casual and welcoming our visitors with us and just mingling and mixing and uh, having a good time being together. So thank you so much. I'd like to open our evening by praying and asking God to speak to us through His Word. Let's pray. Our Grace Assembly Father, we adore You, we praise You. Lord, thank You that You are faithful, that You are gracious, that You are loving, but You are also, Lord, a holy, holy, holy God. And Lord, we confess that we are sinful, Lord. We are unholy, in need of Your forgiveness. And thank You, Lord, out of Your love, your gracious love, Lord, you sent your one and only Son, Jesus, Lord, to come on this earth, to live like us, yet without sin. And Lord, thank you that through his gracious actions on the cross and through the grave, Lord, that we are forgiven. We are declared just as if we would not sinned. And Lord, that when we repent and when we believe, Lord, we are saved by the work of the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we want to savor the good news. We want to cherish the good news of Jesus and his saving love. And, Lord, we pray that your spirit, which is in us, Lord, would uh, help us to rejoice and cherish and uh, be captured anew what we have in Jesus Christ and what, we, what you have done for us. And, Lord, help us to, out of thankfulness for being saved, Lord, to understand the good news clearly and to be able to explain that simply and winsomely. And Lord, as we speak the good news, Lord, we know that the gospel is powerful unto salvation. And Lord, we look forward to your spirit doing a great work through us and in us. Lord, as we pray for our lost family and friends. And Lord, as we have opportunities that you give us, Lord, that we will speak the good news. And Lord, uh, we pray that these seeds that we're scattering and watering, Lord, that you would give the growth in your good time. So Lord, thank you for our spiritual food that you will speak to us tonight. And Lord, thank you also for the physical food that we can enjoy tonight. And may you bless it to our bodies. Thank you, Lord, for the gracious hands that have prepared it. And we pray, Lord, that you will, yeah, uh, help us to have a really good evening tonight. And Lord, may God the Father, and Christ Jesus, our Lord, give us grace, mercy, and peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, last week uh, we looked at uh, explaining Christianity. And explaining Christianity is all about Jesus Christ. And last week, our first night, it was considering who Jesus is. And we looked at the opening verse in Mark chapter 1. And that verse said, it's all about Jesus being the Son of God. And as the Son of God, Jesus has great authority. Jesus is God and is also man in one. And thirdly, we said that Jesus is the supreme king. And that's the word Christ. The word Christ is the anointed king of our Lord. And we also were, saw from Mark that this great king who has so much authority calls us to follow him, to submit our lives to him. And so today we go from who is Jesus and we are going to be considering why did Jesus come to earth? Why did Jesus come to earth? 
So before we start, I'd like you please to take your handouts and on the back, I'd like you to write down some thoughts. All right, imagine you are at your work Christmas breakup. Okay, I know some of you are retired, but just imagine. All right, and you're chatting to one of your friends and he's saying, what are you going to do on Christmas Day? And you say to that friend, I am going to church. And he says to you, what is Christmas all about? Why are you celebrating Christmas? So with those thoughts, maybe you think about that work friend. How would you explain to him why Christ came on that first Christmas? Just for 30 seconds, write on your piece of paper your answer. Why did Jesus come? How would you answer that friend at work? A few more seconds to write down a couple of points. Why did Jesus come? Now as we read some of the answers, and you have the answers on the other sheet, we are going to start by reading Mark chapter 8. So let's take our Bibles please, and Hetty is going to read Mark chapter 8 verses 27 to 31 on if you've got a black Bible underneath your seats or in front of your seats it's on page 895 895 thank you Hetty Peter's confession of the Messiah Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi and on the road, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They answered him, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he strictly warned them to tell no one about him. Then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests and scribes, be killed and rise after three days. Thank you, Hetty. So what does Jesus say he came to do? What does Jesus say he came to do in verse 31? He says, suffer, that's right, and be killed, and be killed. What a surprising answer for this supreme king, this person with great authority. He said, I am come to suffer and be killed and rise after three days. That's a bit of a shock, isn't it? Imagine his disciples, his closest followers that he's called to follow them. He tells them, I have come to suffer and be killed and rise after three days. What also struck out to me in verse 31 is this word necessary. Ne necessary. It was necessary that he be killed. That's really important. What he was saying was that this, his death, was all part of God's sovereign plan. It was necessary. The son knows what his purpose is. It wasn't an accident. So why is Jesus' death so, so significant. Let's read now from Mark chapter 15, verses 33 to 39, to answer that very question. 
Why is Jesus' death so significant? It's on page 905. Thank you, Hedy. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, See, he is calling for Elijah. When some of, um, someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, fixed it on a stick, offered him a drink and said, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. Jesus let out a loud cry and breathed his last. Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. Thank you. Now in this passage, which is describing Jesus' death, there's lots of things happening. But tonight I want to focus on three main things. And the first thing I'd like us to consider is the darkness. Now our text tonight <coughs> says that it was three, uh, from noon until three in the afternoon. For three hours, something strange, something unusual, something very supernatural was taking place. Now quite a few of you have been to Israel. It's on one of my bucket lists. And you tell me that it's, the sun is out, it is searing heat right at noon. But for three hours, from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, there's darkness that comes over as Christ was dying. And in the Bible, darkness usually means judgment. What's happening in those three hours is there's judgment happening on the Son of God. So firstly, darkness, something very supernatural happening. And secondly, in verse 34, we see Jesus giving out his last cry. Eloi, Eloi. Lama Sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you abandoned or forsaken me? Now, some scholars think that Jesus has lost faith in his Father. But as we've already seen in the previous passage, it was necessary. Jesus, the Son, knew what was going to happen. And at that point, in those three hours, our Lord was acting as our substitute. As our substitute. He was experiencing the judgment, the holy anger, or we say it's God's wrath of the Father. The anger, the wrath, the punishment that we should have experienced for all of our sin and our rebellion against God. All that is being poured out onto Jesus Christ. I'd like to share with you an illustration. So all of us need to grab the Bible, but I'd like you to imagine, so grab the Bible, and I'd like you to imagine that this book, imagine, just imagine, that this book represents your life. And on page one, it's your birth. And on the last page, it's our death. All right? And on each page of this book is recorded each occasion that we have broken God's laws. Every wrong deed, every wrong word, every wrong thought, everything is written in this book. Just imagine, okay? 
And on those pages are written our sin. Now I'd like you to hold out your left hand. Okay? And between your palm, which stands for us and our lives, which are daily committing sin, okay? And you place your, that book on your left hand. And imagine, so this is your life, okay? And everything written in it. And imagine, just imagine, all right? Just imagine the ceiling is our holy Holy, holy God. Between us and our holy, holy, holy God, there is separation because all of our sin, which is written in that book. Because although God is a loving, gracious God, our God is a holy God. And He hates sin. And He also must punish us for all of our sin. So we have two problems, all of us. Our books, our lives, which is filled with sin. That's our first problem. And the second problem is that God, our holy God, must punish us for all of our sin. Now I just want to imagine, just imagine... Okay, now you put out your right hand. Our right hand stands or represents Jesus. Again, just, this is just an illustration. Please don't write in. <laughs> this is just an illustration. All right, this stands for Jesus. And the ceiling again stands for our holy, holy, holy God. But in our right hand, which stands for Jesus... There's no book there. Because our Lord was sinless. He was perfect. He kept God's laws perfectly. He was sinless. And now while Jesus is dying on the cross, He was taking the punishment for the sins of the people in every age. So now I'd like you to transfer that book onto your right hand. At that moment, instead of pouring all of his wrath, his holy anger, God's punishment on us, that's been put on his son, Jesus. That is why... The day that Jesus died is called Good Friday. Our Lord is taking all of our punishment, all of our sins upon Himself. And three days later, God miraculously brought our Lord to life. Now look at your left hand, it's empty. How much sin remains between you and our holy, holy God? How much sin? Sorry? Nothing. Nothing. It's all been put on our Lord. So when a person believes in Jesus Christ, God counts him or her sinless. God says... To you, it's like you've just as if I'd never sinned, justified, sinless, perfect, just as Christ Jesus himself. But this forgiveness is not automatically put on everyone. It's only those who repent of their sins and believe in Jesus. So that's what's happening. Jesus is crying, abandoned by the Father. He's being a substitute, taking the punishment that was due on you and me.
So firstly, the darkness. Secondly, Jesus' cry. And thirdly, in verse 38, we see another supernatural thing happening in verse 38. What does verse 38 say in your Bibles? Let's read that together. Then the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now in Jesus' time, the Jewish people had a temple in Jerusalem. And this temple had a massive, a very thick curtain. Now I've got a very pale illustration here. <laughs> Just imagine this is the Jerusalem temple. And in the inner courts, the priests would do their sacrifices. They would burn the incense. They would light the things they would light. And, on, uh, so, and then behind the curtain was the Holy of Holies. It's where the Lord dwelt, where the Lord lived with the people on earth. And the curtain which separated where the priests did their daily tasks and between the Holy of Holies, the curtain represented a separation, a separation between a holy, holy God and a sinful people. But when Jesus died, this curtain which stood for a separation, this curtain was torn from top to bottom. And that symbolized that symbolized that, that separation between our holy God and us as people was no more there, that separation. Because our Lord paid for our sins, and so we have direct access now. There's no more separation. And we can approach a holy, holy, holy God through our Lord Jesus Christ, our merciful High Priest. So when you are thinking about why Jesus came, these three things need to be so important. Jesus' death is central to Christianity. We need to savor it, be thankful for it, be grat grateful for, our, for what our Lord has done for us. I'd like us to turn to Mark chapter 10 now, on page 898, and we're going to read verse 45 of chapter 10. Thank you, Ellie. On page 898. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is what Jesus said he came to do. His purpose clause. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. What is this word ransom? This word ransom. It's really important for us as believers to know what it means very deeply because this is what our Lord came to do. We pay a ransom if someone is kidnapped. In history, as you look back in church history, a ransom was sometimes paid to buy back a soldier who had been captured. Sometimes a ransom was paid to purchase a slave.
to free a slave. A ransom is a price you pay to buy back. A ransom is a price you pay to save another person's life. Jesus said that he came to earth to give his life as a ransom, to pay the price to set us free, set us free from Satan's captivity on you and me, to set us free from Satan's hold on you and me. Well, Jesus died. The price for your life has been paid to set you free. However, we have to accept it. We have to accept it. Receive it by faith. I'd like us to imagine again that each of you had a debt of $10 million. Each of you had a debt of $10 million. And you could not possibly pay it back. Okay, just imagine, you have this massive debt owing over your head, and you cannot pay it back. But because I used to work in the ANZ Bank, I'm a very, very generous person. I walk in tonight, and I write you out a check. It's a good bank, the ANZ Bank. I write you all a check for $10 million. Now, when I hand you the check, I'm going to hand you the check. Congratulations. <laughs> when I hand you the check, is your debt paid? That's the wrong answer. <laughs> It's not paid. You still have that debt. Your debt is paid when you take that check and you take it to the bank, to the ANZ Bank at Q, and you bank that check. If you decide to rip that check up and throw it on the ground, your debt is still there. Even though I've written that check, I've signed the check, You need to accept the check, bank the check, for that debt to be repaid, for that check to be any good. Jesus has paid the price for our sins. And unless we accept it, it does not do us any good. We will still have to pay for all of our sin. So you can accept Jesus' offer to take your place, to be God forsaken on your behalf, or you can reject Jesus' offer and suffer God's rightful anger against you. See, friends, that is the good news. That our Lord paid for our sins by dying for us. But that is only half of the good news. If we only stay at the cross, we are left with a dead king. If we only stay at the cross, we only have half the truth. But the story isn't finished. Jesus didn't stay dead, did he? The Bible tells us that Jesus, on the third day, he rose from the dead. 
and our record of his resurrection is not fiction. The record of his resurrection is based on true eye.